Well, if uh, we have any guests here this morning, I want to welcome you and, and thank you for worshiping with us here this morning. Uh, Memorial Day weekend. I'm an assistant minister on staff here. My name is Randy Hartz, and uh, we're going to be sharing from the Word of God. We're going to be talking about returning to the Word. We, we shared Wednesday night on returning to the Word and, and talk specifically about the authority of God's Word. And today, uh, we're going to talk about returning to the Word and specifically about the rhema Word of God. We're going to spend some time going over, you know, again, you know, kind of the, the high notes of what we talked about Wednesday night, just faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing, right? So it's just layer upon layer, truth upon truth to, to open this up and unfold it to us. But the goal of this is, is simply to, to really get us to recognize and, and understand the importance of God's Word, how important it is to, to have God's Word in our life and just encourage you to on a daily basis spend time in the Bible. You know, I know for newer people, you, you might hear people say, oh, you need to be in the Word. And, and that's simply talking about being in the Bible. Amen? The basics. You know, Vince Lombardi had a, it was before the, the Super Bowl, but they had a, still a world championship in the, in the NFL. And, and he had led the Green Bay Packers to become world champions. And the next year, pretty much had the same team out there. And he lined everybody up. And he said, gentlemen, this is a football those were the basics, blocking, tackling, you know, get great at the basics. So men and women, this is a Bible. Amen? This is your lifeline. This is your instruction book as a Christian to teach you how to live a life of victory as you're on your way to heaven. Amen? I took this poll that I found. It pulled 40,000 people. I think they were aged 10 to, to like 80 years old, and, and it was a Christian organization that pulled this. They wanted to, to find out what are some of the benefits that, that you receive from, from reading the Bible. And they were surprised at, at some of the information that they gathered that they weren't even looking for. They found out that if you only read the Bible between one and three times per week, there was little change in people's lives. It was almost like you didn't open the Bible at all if there was one to three times a week. But the magic number was four. Four or more times per week, if you open up the Bible and come into church, because we open up the Word of God here, is one of those times. But if you just come to church two or three times a month, and that's the only time that you open the Bible, there's not going to be much change in your life. It's going to take a long time. Carl talked about seed, time, and harvest. It's going to be a long time that it's going to take for change to happen in your life. But again, four or more times a week, I'd recommend opening up your Bible seven days a week, right? And that's the, the encouragement, uh, uh, you know, after going through, you know, what we talked about last Wednesday and Sunday and today is to, to challenge you to make this decision. But some of the benefits of reading your Bible four times or more per week, look at this, it's feeling lonely and, and anger issues dropping and bitterness and relationship dropping 30 to 40%. Just by reading your Bible, four or more times per week. Alcoholism drops, sex outside of marriage drops, feeling spiritually stagnant drops, and viewing pornography drops around 60% in each of those areas, again, just by reading your Bible. On the flip side, being in your Bible and, and reading God's Word, it helps you to share your faith over 200% and, and it helps you to disciple others. It, it jumps up 230% compared to the person that's only reading their Bible one to three times or, or worse yet, not in it at all. So that's clear that there are benefits to reading the Bible. I mentioned Wednesday night that I had a thought that you'd have to be an idiot, you'd have to be crazy not to get into this Bible. Again, I, I would never say that to you, but I just thought that to myself. Amen. You've got to be crazy not to read the Bible, especially after you see those statistics, because again, success leaves clues. Amen. But it starts with making a decision. What, what is a decision? It means to decide means to cut off from, to cut off all other options. When you decided to follow Jesus, you cut off all other options of, of the world and, and, and you turn from, from living for the world you turn from that way and you, you turned and decided to follow Jesus and this is our instruction manual and it teaches us how to, how to be godly men and women. It teaches us how to be husbands and, and wives. It teaches you how to raise your kids. It teaches you how to raise your finances. It teaches you how to act in relationship with other people. Amen? This is where you find all of that is in the Bible. Amen. But you've got to read it. Right. Amen? So, so the challenge is to make this decision to get into your Bible and read it each and every day. And I would challenge you definitely to have yourself a plan. Step one is, is to get a Bible, right? 
Nothing wrong with reading it on an app on your phone, but there is something still about getting in and flipping through the pages. I know even when I study that, I've lost a little of my agility in the Bible because I'll, I'll study on a computer and, and just look at you know, different translations and whatnot. And, and it, and it kind of has dumbed me down as far as like being agile in the Bible and, and where things are at. So again, there's, there's power in having a physical Bible. Amen. And then get yourself a journal. Get a notebook. You know, I've told you many times that after high school, I swore I'd never read another book if it wasn't Sports Illustrated or, or Muscle and Fitness. I didn't understand the concept of being a lifelong learner. And then when we started out in business, I had a guy come up to me and, and give me a journal. And I was like, first of all, I'm not going to read a book, and this book doesn't have any words in it. What am I going to do with a journal? And he said, well, when you come to meetings and, and whatnot, just write down things that, that stick out to you. Amen. And we were taught, never leave your, fort, or never leave your future, or, or excuse me, let, never leave your, your, yeah, your future up to your memory, right? Because your, your memory is going to lack. How many times do you leave church service and you're like, man, that was an awesome service, but you can only maybe remember 10 to 15% of things that were, were taught or spoken about. That's where having a journal to, to write down the scriptures and, and take notes and, and you're in this atmosphere of faith where God will speak to you and, and you, you take those notes and whatnot. And then during the week, that's one way that you can get into the Bible for yourself and see it for yourself is, is what Pastor Mike is teaching. Does that line up with the word of God? Which it does. When Randy speaks, does it line up with the Word of God? You know, and, and again, that's where it'll go from just the written Word of God, the Logos, to the Rhema Word of God, the spoken Word of God, right? That, that comes alive within us, which is what we're going to talk about here today. Amen? Amen. Carl mentioned the scripture, and, and I'll tell you what, faith is absolutely the foundation of everything, and, and faith comes by hearing, right? Jesus said it. He said, he said, you know, I, I liken the wise person, like Carl mentioned in that scripture, to the one that, that not only hears the word, but does the word. Amen. When the adversity and the challenges and the storms of life blow on that person's house, that's built his life on the solid foundation of the Bible, of the word of God, that house will stand. But the one that, that builds it on, on just the worldly values and the worldly views, when the, the you know, money being the most important thing rather than faith and then family and then your personal health and wellness and then finances finally, that, that's, that's the order of importance in, in my life and, it, and it's a good way to build your lifestyle because that faith is the foundation, amen? But if you build it where money's the most important then it's, it's your own needs next and, and then maybe your relationships and, and a little bit of time with God, I'm telling you, when the adversities and storms and challenges of life blow against you, that house is not gonna stand, it's gonna fall. But like Carl said, if you build your life on the solid rock, the foundation of Jesus Christ and, and God's word, it will stand the test of time. You don't have to go looking for those adversities. They're going to find you. But when they do find you, you're going to find yourself standing. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 <clears throat> says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Interesting. It says faith comes by hearing, not reading the Word of God. Right. Now we're talking about getting in your Bible and reading the Word of God, but yet faith comes by hearing. Amen. If it came just by reading, you, you'd think about it, the Pharisees would have been the, the strongest people of faith back in Jesus' day because they literally memorized the Torah. Even Jews today, they, you know, up in, at, at age 12, they've got to have Genesis through Deuteronomy Memorize those five books of the Bible. And then, and then by, throughout their teenage years, they're memorizing Psalms and Proverbs. You think about that. So you'd think these Pharisees would, would have all the faith. But we know that, that it was otherwise by the, the, the stories and, and the Gospels and what Jesus talked about, right? The Pharisees and religious people didn't have the faith. It was actually the fishermen, the publicans, the harlots, and the, the centurions. That's who he said had great faith. Why? Because... They not only heard the word, but they applied the word. They acted on the word. They believed the word. There was corresponding action to the word. Amen? And that's the difference here. So we're going to talk about today that, that faith comes by the rhema word, not the logos word. However, we have to have the logos word to receive the rhema word. Amen. And I'm not trying to confuse you here. This will all make sense as we go. But saying that, Romans 10, 17, another way, faith comes by hearing, but hearing spiritually comes by the word of God. You've got two sets of ears. You've got your outer ears, and you've got a set of inner ears. And I'll tell you what, faith really comes when you start speaking 
what God has spoken. When you put the word in your heart and you speak out of your mouth, that's when faith really starts to build and grow in your life. Amen? Amen. And a big problem nowadays is, is people are getting faith in their head, but not in their heart. And we're going to solve that issue here this morning by talking about the rhema word of God. Wednesday night, we talked about the word coming to us in, in three different forms. The first form the word comes to us is, is as Jesus. Jesus is the living word of God. The second form is logos, which is the written word of God. And the third form is rhema, which is the spoken word of God. And we spent a lot of time, to, time Wednesday night on, on, on the first two of those, Jesus and, and logos. And today we're going to unfold the rhema word of God in greater detail. But let's touch on on those first two here for a moment. So Jesus, the living word of God. Open your Bibles again to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Hallelujah. Good to hear pages turning this morning. John chapter 1 verse 1. It says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So when they're talking about uh, made by him and, and without him, who are they talking about here? Jesus, right? Jesus is the living word. In the beginning, in Genesis, it was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity has always been from the beginning. They were in heaven, and, and God spoke the earth into existence, Right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You can always look at, at, at Bible translations to see if, if it's a Christian Bible or not because the, the Trinity, that's a big issue with other religious organizations. It, it'll say, in the beginning was, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a little g God because they don't believe Jesus was actually God. But we know that Jesus is God, amen? He was God. He is God. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen? He is the living word. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the word, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. So God the Son came out of heaven, down to earth, born of a Virgin Mary, right? And, and, and he was clothed in flesh. That's Jesus. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I mentioned this before, but if, if God were to look up and, and take a selfie, the image would look like Jesus, because Jesus is God, and God is Jesus in the flesh. So if you want to know, you remember when they'd go, WWJD, what would Jesus do in these circumstances? It's a great attribute to live by. Amen. In this situation, how would I respond? Well, how would Jesus respond? And, and we, we should respond the way Jesus does, because he, he said, I do nothing except what I see my father do, and we want to be like our father, our father God, amen? And Jesus was our example. Amen? Amen. 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 This full of grace and truth, I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail, but I, I touched on that briefly on, on, on Wednesday night, that that's how Jesus spoke to people. He was full of grace and truth. And I remember when I, my wife and I first came here, we weren't married and we we're at a, a friend of ours, Stan's wedding. And, and uh, it was a real small wedding. And, and afterwards, Pastor Mike, he used to come to my gym. And so he comes up to us and this was BC before Christ. We were living together, you know, life were train wrecked. And, and uh, he said to me with a smile, he goes, hey, he goes, God cannot bless your sin. So you need to make an honest woman out of, out of this gal. And I'll tell you what, he spoke grace and truth. It, he spoke the truth in love. That's the key. See, his heart wasn't to, to you know, chop me off at the knees and, 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 and be better than me and, and pow me down. No, not at all. He was trying to help me. He was saying, hey, Randy, I'm telling you, man, you, you get married, God will bless your marriage and your relationship and, and get on track and do it God's way and God will bless your marriage. That, that was his heart. And that's how we're to speak. Amen? I was sharing this story with, with Kirk Wellman just a few days ago and how, how Pastor had spoke to me and, and, and Kirk had shared with me, you know, sometimes in his life when, when Pastor had come over and, and just, just loved him and, and encouraged him but also spoke truth to him. And, and Kirk said how, how different his life is. He goes, man, I, I can't even remember how I used to think. Amen. And I'll tell you what, that's because of, of the truth, because of the, the Word of God going into his life. And that's a testimony. Amen? And it's a testimony of his wife, Trish, standing in the gap for Kirk for years, believing God that he would change and grow, and, and now his whole life is different. Can't even recognize his life before. That's the power of Jesus Christ and the Bible. 
but you got to get in it. You got to read it. Amen. You got to put it in you. Amen. Amen. So that's Jesus, the, the written, or excuse me, the living word of God. Second, we've talked about the logos, the, the written word of God. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Logos is the written word of God. So 2 Timothy, Paul said to Timothy this, he said, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That word of truth there is, is, is the Greek word logos, the written word of God. So what is it saying here? Study to show yourself approved unto God. Are we looking for God's approval? Well, we really already have it because he said, you know, like he said to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If you're born again, he is, he is well pleased with you. But again, when we study the word of God, it's to change our our thinking process and, and our outlook and whatnot because, again, we want to be pleasing to him rather pl- than pleasing to man, right. right? The world will teach you to adjust its values to, to, and the culture will try to, to seep into Christianity to, to try to get you ch- to change and to adjust to it, and it should be the other way around, amen? I remember when Travis, again, you know, first got born again, he just came and he spent time with us, you know, in our household to see how we operated and how we spoke to one another, and he, you know, he and I were, were training partners before Christ, so he knew me BC, and then he saw me after Christ, and he saw the change and the difference, and he was attracted to that, what? Not my life. Life. It was Jesus in me based on the Bible, and he put that same word in him, and it created the same transformation in him, and now he's doing the same thing for other people. Amen? That's how the whole thing works. It's as simple as that. Amen? But that's the written word of God. And we talked Wednesday night about the Holy Spirit being the, the authority. He's the author of the Bible. Now, it was transcribed or, or written down. It was penned by men, but the author of it was God. Amen? And I don't understand all of it. I, I, I know there's passages in here that I can't make sense of, but instead of arguing and fighting with one another, go to the author and ask him. Amen. And the answer will come to you. Amen? Amen? And instead of us finding differences, let's find similarities. Jesus Christ was crucified, right? He died. He, he, he was rose again on the third day. He's seated in, in the, the place of heaven at the right hand of God, and he's coming again to, to judge the living and the dead. And if you receive that, that free gift of salvation, it'll change absolutely every, everything for you. That's the foundation of everything else that we do. Is everything else important? Absolutely. But if you miss that key point, none of, it, none of the other stuff matters. Amen. If you're not saved, if you're not born again. Amen? Amen. Matter of fact, if you're not born again, you're not going to be able to understand this thing anyway. I remember I came here back in like 98 or 99 and, and uh, came forward and made a profession and then I was going to go home and read my Bible. So I started on page one, my Gideon Bible. I couldn't understand a lick of it. Now, I was disciplined. I made it about two weeks right before bed and then, of course, you know, I didn't understand. I didn't understand you needed to be discipled. I didn't understand I was a little infant and I needed somebody to, to teach me the Word of God, to, to feed me the milk and then the bread and then, and then the meat, Amen. And that's what Pastor Mike has done in my life for the past 21 or 22 years and, and many of your lives as well. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. I'm going to hit on a lot of scriptures here, but we're going to just talk again the logos and just how important the written word of God is. And my prayer is again that, that it just challenges you to get in the Bible on a daily basis. That's the goal. Because who's in the White House is not going to change this nation. Who's in your house, this house, that's what's going to change this nation. It's going, to, it's going to come from within. And this is the instruction manual. It teaches you how to live a life of godliness. And then you teach that to your neighbors and their neighbors, and it's a, it's a multiplication process. That's what changes things. Luke 8, 11, it says, Now the parable is this, the seed of the word of God. Excuse me, the seed is the word of God. That's that same word, logos, there. So when you, when you plant a seed, a corn seed in the ground, it produces a harvest, right? The, Carl said, set me up here. When you put the seed in the ground, you don't have to worry about it. The seed knows what to do. The ground knows what to do. It germinates. You know, you water it. You know, a few weeks and months later, you've got a, a plant that comes up. It's the same way in your life. When you take the seed, the logos, the written word of God, and you deposit this in your heart, it's going to produce a harvest in your life. So when you look at those areas, your faith... 
your relationship with God, your family, your relationship with, with friends and family and one another, your, your personal health and fitness and, and your financial life. If, if you don't like where you're at right now, it's because the seeds that you've sown up to this point are not probably seeds from the word of God, right? So if you don't like the harvest that you're living in, the bad news is that today is the worst, well, really it's good news, today is the worst day that it's ever gonna be because the good news is is you can start planting different seed and get a different harvest. And like Carl said, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it will happen over time, amen? Amen. And y'all are living proof of that. How many people's lives have changed since you started putting the word of God in your life, amen? And if you didn't raise your hand, it's because you're not in the Bible. I I, I promise you that. We can lay hands on you. We can pray for you. All that stuff is good and well. But until you get in this book yourself and start feeding on the Word of God, no change is going to happen. It's just the reality of it. I was a fitness coach for 25 years. It's joining the gym. We'd have people join the gym January 1st. They were excited, raring to go, and we'd never see them again. Just having the gym membership in your pocket doesn't change anything. Amen? Praying a prayer is awesome, but it's what are you doing after that prayer? You've got to put some effort and work into it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. You want a different harvest? You've got to plant different seeds. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, for the word of God, again, this is the word logos, it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That, that's kind of a mouthful here. It's, it's a lot of stuff. But basically what is it saying is, is this, is that the word of God is a discerner between spirit, soul, and body. Okay, this is what it does. It, when, when you put the word in it, it provides nourishment for your spirit. Just like your, your physical body needs nourishment, it needs sleep, it needs water, it needs a certain amount of nutrients and whatnot. Your, your, your human spirit feeds on God's word. This is what is our nourishment for our spirit. It, it renews the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. That's what it does. It, 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 Romans 12, 12, 12, 2 talks about that. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This takes... The, the stinking thinking that you had before you became a Christian, and it renews your mind to God's, God's way of thinking. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But you have to get in here to see how God thinks and put it in here so then it can renew our mind. Right. Amen? Amen? And it also puts the body under subjection. Because what happened in the garden when, when Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, right, and, and then Adam ate of it, they died spiritually. So before that, the spirit was in control of the mind, will, and emotions, the soul, and the body was in subjection. But when the spirit died and went dormant, then the soul, the mind, will, and emotions became the one in charge along with the body. And that's how it was for us before Christ. And then you get born again and your spirit is made alive. Now all of a sudden there's this this fight, what Pastor Mike was talking, the clash between two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. I was 28 years old, so I had 28 years of living like the world, doing things the way that the world did, you know, buying and selling, manipulating, doing all that stuff. Now all of a sudden I become a Christian and I didn't even know how to think and operate. And that's where I had to get in here to again renew my mind to see how God operates and how God thinks, and that's what created change. Not overnight, but over time. The seed you sow. Amen? Amen. What else does it say here? That the word of God, it's alive. It's alive. It's not not this dead letter. It's only dead if it's just sitting there on the shelf collecting dust. Then it is just a bunch of black ink on white pages. It doesn't become alive until you read it and put it in. Amen? Otherwise, it is just a dead letter. But the Word of God, it is alive, and it's powerful. And what it does is it goes in and it does surgery. It cuts out all the, the old garbage and, and, and replaces it with new stuff, right? It, it, the water of the washing of the Word. It, you, you can't, you've got to replace old thoughts with new thoughts, and this is where you get those new thoughts at. But again, you've got to read it, and you've got to put it in. But when it does surgery, it, it, it shows you what's wrong with you. It also shows you what, what's right with you. And, and it gives you the power and the ability to change because, again, it's alive and you can stand on it. Amen. Amen? You know, I think of people that have, you know, maybe anger issues. 
You go in the Bible and, and you find some, some Bible verses on anger. It, you know, be, be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Uh, or, yeah, be, be slow to speak and, and, uh, and slow to anger. So then you, you start reading that and you're like, at first it, it doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but then you start meditating on it. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And you meditate on that and you think it through. You start putting it in your own vernacular. That means I got two ears and, and one mouth. I should be twice, doing twice as much listening, half as much talking. I should shut my big fat mouth and, and, and not be talking so much and running off at it. I should be slow to anger. And then when a situation arises, you'll, you'll find yourself and, you know, the, the old person would have, would have flared up, but all of a sudden that scripture comes up, nope, I'm quick to listen. I don't understand everything. I'm not going to run my mouth and I'm not going to get angry at this. And that creates change. That's that scalpel of the word of God going in your heart and pre- creating change in you. That's how the whole thing works. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Last scripture on logos, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We spent time on this Wednesday night, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this as we get into the, the rhema word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the reason why? That the man or woman of God may be perfect or, or mature, thoroughly finished, furnished unto all good works. And we talked about this, that, that that word inspiration means God breathed. So this is the inspired, the, the God breathed word that we read. Amen. That's why it is alive and it is po- powerful. Who authored the Bible? God, the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. He's the author of the Bible. Now, humans wrote it, but it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And you got to get to a point where, like in business, we taught this. If, if we had a question that, that we didn't know the answer to, we'd say, hey, I don't know about that, but, but I'll go find it out for you. And it's the same way with this. It's like you don't have to have every answer to everything. And so don't get into debates with people, especially if they're not born again, because they don't have the illumination, they don't don't have the revelation, they don't have, you know, the the Spirit of God even living in them. So again, you're just talking carnally to them, love them, pray for them, yes, answer the questions as, as much as you can, but again, they don't have the capacity until they get born again to understand what's in this book. Otherwise, it's just, again, black ink on white pages, and never forget that. So you don't have to have all the answers is what I'm trying to say. And it's okay. So you pray with them. Hey, you know what? I don't know about that, but I know the author and he'll answer your questions and then sit and pray with them and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal himself first of all to them because even if you answer every one of their questions, those answers aren't going to get them born again. It's the Holy Spirit that draws them, amen? amen? And quickens the word and creates faith on that word. So It says, all scripture given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? It's simply teaching or instruction. You know, here we teach that the Bible says that that you dedicate your babies rather than having them baptized as infants. That you get water baptized after you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and and you have the awareness to be able to, to understand what happened there. That's when you get water baptized. That... What are some other, other doctrines? The baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's Pentecost Sunday today. So the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. The Trinity, we talked about in the beginning. The Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit, that they're, they're three different parts in one. Doesn't make any sense to my mind, but again, I believe it by faith because the Bible says so. Amen? And the new birth. You can't explain the supernatural to somebody else, but you can experience it. Amen? Explain to somebody what it, what it feels like to have peace and joy and be born again. It's impossible. But you know that you know that you know that it's happened to you. For doctrine, for reproof, which is, is criticism for a fault. You know, if, if you're constantly being late for work and then you get in the Bible and you're, you're reading and God starts dealing with you on that, it'll, it'll reprove you. It'll correct you. It'll, it'll get you back on track which is what we want. We want to have these guardrails in our lives to keep us down the center and and keep us out of the ditches on either side of the road, right? We want to to stay down the road or the center of the road so it it corrects us. And then finally, it instructs us. It it tells us what to do and what not to do. And it's for our benefit. Just like Pastor Mike speaking to me years ago and Melissa when we came here, 
He wasn't trying to beat me down. He was trying to instruct me. He was really trying to father me. I'm telling you, I would not be here today if it were not for that conversation because it was a man that was willing to speak to me. 280 pounds, jacked bodybuilder. I mean, huge. He was a 160-pound little, little guy. Nobody talked to me like that. But I was really a scared, insecure guy on the inside. Grew up without a dad. I didn't understand my identity. So I thought, man, the bigger I make myself, nobody's going to mess with me. I'm going to get the girl, the money, the success, the fame. That was the identity. And I just simply went out and created that. And Pastor Mike, he saw right through that. And on, the honest thing was, is he saw where, you know, what God had for me rather than what I had created with my own hands. Amen? Amen. And praise God for that. That's a gift. That's the gift of having a pastor in your life. Amen? And that's why I'm here today. Because he spoke the truth in love. Grace and truth. Amen? Amen. So that's the, the, the logo. Now the, the rhema is the word of God spoken. Turn in your Bibles to, to uh, John chapter 6, verse 63. And again, the reason that we read this doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in, in righteousness. It's to mature us, to, to help us grow up spiritually, just like a child goes from being an infant to a, a toddler, you know, to a, a, an older child, and then a young, young adult, and then to adulthood stage. And that's how we are in, as Christians as well, right? We go through those stages of growth. So how long does it take to grow up? That's your choice. The more seed, the more word, the more time you spend with God, the faster that process happens. But there's certain things that we can't speed up. It's just the, through the process of time. That's why it's so important to, to be reading your Bible and, 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 and journaling and studying and, and showing up for church and, and, and doing all the things, serving, doing all that stuff, because that is what's going to grow you up and help you to mature. Amen? And I, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm just saying I'm living proof of this. I'm not going to tell you something that I haven't done myself. Amen? Amen. So the rhema word of God is, is the word of God spoken. It's, it's a word that's spoken by a living voice. Is God a living voice? Yes or no? Yes. Are you a living voice? Yes. So the rhema is the word of God spoken. Again, it's just words or, or letters on a page until it's given life to. Amen. In John 6, 63, Jesus said this, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words, this is the word rhema here, that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Hallelujah. The words that Jesus speaks, they are, they are spirit and they are life. The, the word quicken there, it means to make alive or to give life. So the rhema word is, is spirit and it's life to us. This is again, I talked about it earlier, this is the nourishment for our spirit. Your body needs vitamins and minerals and, and, and fish oil and, and you know, different, um, you know, all the stuff and things, right? Hydration, all that stuff, sleep, all that. This is the nourishment for your spirit. So if you're finding yourself in a point in life where you're, you're not living in victory in any area, it's because your, your spirit man is, is malnourished. You got to feed it. You got to meditate on it. It's not about getting a, a ton of, uh, uh, of Bible in. It's about meditating on the Bible that you do have. What's Kenneth Copeland always say? One word from God can change everything. One rhema word from God can change everything. That's what he's talking about there. Because again, you have groups that memorize whole chapters and whole, whole books of the Bible, but if there's no transformation power there, if there's no rhema there, there's going to be no change. Amen? So the logos is important. You don't have the rhema without the logos, but the logos, the, the written word, is the basis for it. Amen? What happens here? It, it goes from being an, an idea or a thought or a concept. That's really all it is. These are, these are God's ideas, God's thoughts, God's concepts that were written down, inspired by God, put down on paper, right? Just like if, if we were to write a book on, on faith or, or finances or, or fitness or whatever, it's our thoughts, our ideas, our concepts on those different avenues. We put those ideas and thoughts down on paper. But because this is the living word, right? You put these thoughts and concepts and ideas down into you and then they become real because they're alive, right? So real that you know that you know that you know that you have what the Word of God says you have. Amen. That you are who the Word of God says that you are. And you can do what the Word of God says that you can do. Yeah. 
just like me before Christ. My identity was creating this big bodybuilder. That was my identity. That's, that's who I was. But again, praise God that he came in November 20th of 2001 when I got arrested for drug traf- trafficking. Best worst day of my life. Worst day because ended up having to spend three and a half years in prison for, for drug trafficking. Best day because the mask finally got to be removed. The, the living a lie. It's, man, I mean, it's so much work living a lie. It's so, so much better just living in the truth, amen? And, and God's word started coming into me and, and, and created change in there, right? It did surgery on my heart and what came, started in the heart ended up coming out and, and manifesting in our lives, amen? Again, it was a process of time, but praise God it happened. So again, you go from, from just reading this to actually believing it. And what's the difference? It's, it's not just reading it, but, but doing what the word of God says to do. It changes you, how you think, It changes how you speak. It changes how you live. It changes who you hang around. And it's challenging when you first get born again. Because, man, I remember Melissa especially, you know, I got, I spent eight and a half months in jail, so I was separated, but she wasn't. And see, the world, you know, back then we were partiers, so how did did we know, how did the world know to to find peace? Well, you just went out to the bar on Friday and Saturday night, and you you drank your sorrows away, and you went out and partied and have fun, so you didn't think about the problems and the challenges, but Melissa was coming here, and and, and a lot of you women were were ministering to her and and loving on her, and the word started to get in her, and it started to change her, and she didn't have a desire to go out anymore, and and guess what? They, They started being critical of her, and they're like, what, you think you're too good for us now? And she's like, no, I don't think I'm too good. I just know if I put myself in that environment, I'm going to do what you're doing, and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do this now, because this is what's changing my life. Amen? Amen. True peace, true joy, true love. That's what the Bible, the Word of God, that's what it will do for you. I'm telling you. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. I know I'm hitting a lot of scriptures, but is this making sense to you this morning? Yeah. Matthew 4.4, 4, again, we, we touched on this Wednesday night, but, but this is Jesus going out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So he had just been baptized by, by John the Baptist. He came up, the, the Holy Spirit came down on him like a dove. It wasn't a dove, it was just like a dove, right? It came upon him, and that's when his ministry started. And, and, and God said to him, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. What is that? That's identity. You are my son, and I am well pleased with you. You haven't done anything yet for me, other than he fulfilled the law for 30 years, but, but his ministry hadn't started yet. He hadn't healed anybody. He hadn't cast out any demons. He hadn't started that, that ministry, right? And you think about it. 30 years to prepare for a three and a half year ministry. Nowadays, we want to spend three and a half years to prepare for a 30 year ministry. Amen? Amen. Amen. So he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and he goes out into the wilderness led by, by the Holy Ghost and, and, and Satan tempts him to, to turn the, the, the stones into bread because he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and he was, he was hungry. I mean, he was, he was 100% man as well as 100% God. And this is how he responded. Verse 4 in, in Matthew 4, it said, But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, rhema, that's the rhema word, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So what is Jesus doing here? He's quoting the written word, the logos, Back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, that's what it says. So back in Deuteronomy 8, we don't have to turn there, but it's, it's the Israelites when they're out in the wilderness and, and God is trying to teach them to trust him. He said, hey, I'm going to give you manna from heaven. Every day, go out and just gather enough manna for today. If you take too much, if you could take enough for tomorrow, because that means that you're not trusting me, right? That manna will end up rotting. So you just take enough for today, eat that, Wake up tomorrow trusting me that your manna will be there for tomorrow as well. And Deuteronomy 8.3 said this. He said, man shall not live by manna, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not a doom and gloom guy, but I know this. They'll end up raising this debt ceiling, but they can't keep raising it and raising it and raising it for, for the next 10, 15, 20, or 30 years. But praise God, we live by a different economy. Where God's word, we don't live by, by bread alone. 
We live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But you got to prepare yourself with it. you got to have this word in you because when the adversities and challenges, like that man that, that put in the word and acted upon that word, he was ready for those challenges. I don't know what we're going to walk in or walk through, but start depositing it now if you haven't already. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here this morning. Your faith family church, you've got the word in you. Amen? Hallelujah. Luke chapter 5, verse 5, as we wrap up the rhema part of this. Set this part up. This is Peter when, when Jesus comes and tells him to cast the net out. Now, you, you think about this. Let's read the scripture here first. It says, Luke chapter 5, verse 5. It, it says, And Simon, answering, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, rhema, that's the rhema word, I will let down the net. So here we have Simon Peter. He's a fisherman. And most of the time back in, back in those days, you did what your father did. So his father was probably a fisherman. He's probably been on fishing boats since, since he was an infant. That's all he knew. He understood it. And he fished all night long. He knew, knows where the fish are at, and he didn't catch a thing. And then now you have Jesus, this carpenter, not a fisherman, but a carpenter, coming along, and what did, it, what did he tell him to do? He said, he said, he said cast your net out, to the other side of the boat. Now, I don't know how big the boat was, 8, 12, 15 feet wide. What is it going to make a difference if I cast it out over here because I've been casting it out over here all night long and I'm a fisherman and I know how to fish. I know where the fish are at. That's what he's thinking. But what does he say? Nevertheless, at your word, right, I will let down the net because you've spoke the word to me. Just something went off in Peter and he was like, huh, Something different about this guy. The rhema word, it, didn't, it bypassed his head because it didn't make any sense and it went straight into the heart and then he acted on that word and we know what happened, right? He caught so much fish that it almost sunk the boat. And it's that way in many of our lives as well, right? You've got a situation, a circumstance, something that you're, you're dealing with. Maybe it's with a loved one or a child or, or, or a health issue or whatever. And that that written word of God, the logos, as you're reading it, all of a sudden something comes into you and it's like, man, that doesn't make any sense. But what do we do so many times? We want to reason it out. Reason is the enemy of faith. Faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by the, the logos the, 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 or the rhema, the, the spoken word of God, you've got to act on that even when it doesn't make sense. Because here's some, here's some Examples of this, a, a, a rhema word of God made Abraham get out of his father's house. A, a rhema word of God turned Peter from a fisherman into a fisher of Peter. It, it turned Saul of Tar Tarsus into the, the, the Paul the Apostle. It made Naaman dip in the, the, the river seven different times. He didn't want to do that. His servant came and said, hey, you know what? You got leprosy. You might as well do what the man of God says to do. And, and he did it grudgingly. But because he was obedient, he dipped seven times in that dirty river. See, he thought he was better than that, right? His ego, his pride. I'm not going to go dip in that, that river that's all dirty and whatnot. Why didn't he just come and lay hands on me? It didn't make any sense. But thank goodness his servant encouraged him to do the rhema, the spoken word of God. The rhema word of God made Israel leave all that they had and all that they knew in Egypt. It made Elisha burn his oxen and his plow and fully commit to following God. The rhema word of God shrunk Gideon's army from 30,000 down to 300. That made no sense. But see, if, if we do what makes sense, then we get the glory, not God. And he wants the glory. That's why we have to make sure that we're standing on the rhema word of God. The rhema word of God caused Pastor Mike and Pastor Vicky to sell everything that they had. Move down to Oklahoma and go to rhema Bible College. Then come up here to Sioux Falls where they, they knew a couple families. They didn't even know them to build a supernatural church. That's the rhema word of God. That's not in here. It doesn't make any sense, but it's in here. Amen. Amen. And we're the, we're the harvest of that rhema word. You all are the harvest of that word. Think about that. What if they hadn't been obedient to that word? We wouldn't be here this morning. Amen. The rhema word of God changed my life. It changed Melissa's life. It's changed my family's life, it, it, and it'll change your life. It's the rhema word of God. Amen? Amen? Joshua 1, as we're wrapping this up here, how do you take the logos, the written word of God, and turn it into 
the rhema word of God? That's what everybody's wondering here this morning, right? It's a great question. How do you take it from the written word of God to the spoken, the rhema word of God? Joshua chapter one. So Moses had had just led all the Israelites and, and he ended up getting in trouble with God. He was supposed to speak to the rock for the rock to bring forth water. Well, he ended up striking the rock twice. Anger issues. Moses had anger issues, right? He, he got upset with the people, so he struck the rock twice rather than speaking to it. And that right there kept him out of the promised land. Pretty crazy. But so now Joshua steps up and Joshua is going to be the leader of this Israelite uh, uh, people to take them into the promised land. And here's what God speaks to Joshua. Joshua chapter one, verse three, it says, God is saying, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, this was God speaking a rhema word to him, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. This is God speaking to him. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. He's saying, I've given you all this land. He's going to have to go do something to possess the land, but I've given it to you already. You're going to have to go defeat the, the enemies, but he's also saying here, hey, I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. That's what he's saying to you here this morning as well. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I don't care what it, what it feels like, what it seems like. You have to understand and, and stand on the rhema word. So how did he do this? Scroll down to verse 8, Joshua 1.8. It says, this book of the law, the way God does things, his commandments, the way he operates, the way he thinks, the way he, he, he views things, his value system, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Here's the key. That you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So good success and and, and the prosperity and, and going into the promised land didn't just happen. He had to meditate on it because again, he's probably looking at those enemies and going, man, I believe God, but man, they're pretty big. I'm going I'm to have to have God on my side. But God told me, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm, I'm with you the whole way. So he, he thought about that for a while and then he meditated on it and it, and it went from being just this, this, this logos word to this rhema word and it, it quickened. It became alive within him and not only did it become alive within him, it became so alive that, that he acted on it. And that's how you know that the word becomes alive because you do something as a byproduct. That's faith. Faith without corresponding action is dead. Talk is cheap. You can say you believe this thing, but your lifestyle will be evident of whether you are actually believing it and walking in it. Amen? And that's not a beat down, you guys. That's an encouragement. This will change your life. I don't care where you're at today. This will change everything for you. But you've got to read it. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to get it in your, your heart. And then you've got to act on it, just like Joshua did. And then you will have good success. So again, the logos is this written word of God. And we have to have the written word of God to then have the spoken word of God, the rhema, for it to illuminate and have revelation in our lives. Let's stand to our feet here this morning. I'm going to lead you in a confession. Again, I'm I'm a coach, right? So I sat before... I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousand plus people over the course of a 25-year career in, in fitness. And I'd have women in there crying about where they're at. And man, I'd just encourage them. I'd say, hey, it doesn't matter what you've done up to this point. If you're ready, if you're ready to make a decision and, and change, change is possible. This is the worst day of, of your whole entire life that from this point forward, we can move forward. I understood the system, the process. I knew how to do it. And if they would just follow that, Travis and Hison and other coaches that, that worked alongside of me, we, we knew the process. If we could just challenge them and, and, and we would always tell them, hey, we'll believe in you until you believe in yourself. That's a coach. That's how pastors operate. They believe in you. They believed in me. They believed in Kirk. They believed in my wife. They believed in Travis. They believed in Amy. They believed in all of you until you all were able to stand on your own two feet and believe in yourself. So again, I don't care what you have or haven't done up to this point. Today is the day that you make a decision to every day 
from this point forward to put something in. Put something in. Get a plan. Amen. If you don't have a plan, we'll help you with a plan. Bible app, I don't know what's it called, the Bible app. I mean, there's tons of plan, plans in there, reading through the New Testament, you know, reading a proverb and a psalm. God wants to know you, right? Ben Priest, what do you say? Our goal is to know God and make him known. You cannot know him apart from this Bible. Amen? So if you're ready to make a decision today to, to, to turn on a dime and, and, and have it change everything, because here's the deal. The goal every day is to grow, expand, and get a little bit better in every area of life that is valuable to you. And you wouldn't be here this morning if your faith and, and your relationship with God was not valuable. So I'm just going to assume that, that, that that's you this morning. So we're going to make this confession. All right? So speak this out. All the faith you can muster. Gusto. You know how we do it. So here we go. So Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit I'm, asking I'm asking you to make the written word, the written word alive, in my life. alive in my life. I make a decision. I, make a decision. I, decide, right I decide right now to read the Bible, to read the Bible. every day. Every day. I, choose I choose to put your word, put your word first, place first place in my life. In my life. I, don't world I don't care what the world says. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. I want to grow. I want to get better. I want to change. I only care what you say. Holy Spirit, quicken the word in me. Make it alive. I make a decision to think what you think, to speak what you speak, to do what you do. I trust you, God. I trust your word. I trust your word. It's, health it's health to my flesh. It's healing to my body. It's, healing to my it's, body. Where, I it's where I find victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of praise. <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and Jesus, I make you Lord of my life, and I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.